What's happening, Hardscapers? This is episode 174 of the How to Hardscape podcast, where we talk about how you can start and grow your hardscaping business. And today's episode is brought to you by Cycle CPA. Go check them out at cyclecpa.com. If you need bookkeeping, accounting, or CFO services, check them out there. Mention How to Hardscape, get $200 off of those services. Once again, cyclecpa.com. We'll be talking more about them later in this episode. And on today's episode, we have Ken Hockeppel. He is the principal consultant with Enterprise Analysis, has a variety of experience in various aspects of business, especially in landscaping. So this is a wide ranging interview covering various aspects of business ownership. So without further ado, let's get into today's episode. Today, we're joined by Ken Hawk Keppel. He is the principal consultant with Enterprise Analysis, having years of experience in a variety of aspects of businesses, and now has worked with dozens of companies across the country, providing counsel and coaching in the green industry and contractor trade sectors. Ken, thank you so much for joining us here. Thank you for having me, Michael. Ken, let's get started to get to know a little bit about you yourself, how you got started in your career all the way into starting Enterprise Analysis. Uh, however much context you want to give our audience, I'll let you take it away there. Well, that goes back a ways, but I, you know, I basically grew up behind a lawnmower and a spade. My dad was in the business. He was a one truck operation out of New Jersey. And, uh, you know, at the young age of 15 or so, I started working with him and uh, he had a great work ethic, and I I learned that from him, and um, enjoyed the industry, and worked for several other landscapers uh, as I went through um, uh, high school and and college as well. Um, I got my degree in landscape architecture um, from Rutgers, and um, I immediately went to work for a company in Maryland, Chapel Valley Landscape Company. Uh, and then uh, not long after there, went over to Rupert Landscape Company, where I spent the majority of my my career. But I've been in all facets of the business, from estimating to sales, business development, uh, management of uh, maintenance branches, construction branches, division manager, um, and ultimately became chief financial officer at Rupert Landscape Company. Um, we sold uh, in 1998 to True Green Land Care. Uh, which is part of the Service Master organization. Um, I then started Enterprise Analysis after that and started consulting for five years. And uh, after five years, Rupert Gang got the band back together again, and and we uh, uh, regrew the business from the beginning um, and uh, grew it to about a hundred million dollar company in about ten years. So. Uh, that was kind of an interesting ride. Um, so, and I was a CFO during uh, most of, most of that period. So that was uh, the scope of my experience. I guess uh, this whole interview could be just about all of your experiences there. I could ask you follow-up questions upon that. And uh, we'd have hours and hours of uh, conversation just about that. But uh, specifically, uh, I reached out to you to, to talk about your consulting. You're, you're speaking with all these different business owners. And obviously, you've uh, coached and consulted many different companies. And I'm sure there's things that come up that allow you to pick apart these common threads of these companies and to decide how you can help them improve their systems, processes, whatever that might be. But Ken, what, where, where do you even start with something like that? When you start consulting a, a business, how do you know which things to look at and how you can get that going to help them improve upon their business? So I, I start the process out by doing some due diligence and asking for uh, you know, financial statements, uh, the reports that you use on a common basis, job cost, estimating systems, sales reports. Um, and I don't ask anybody to create anything, you know, for me. Just show me what you're using. Um, and that generally points me in, in the directions I need to go to be able to uh, take the, the company to a, a new performance level. But I follow that up with uh, interviews of the key employees. So uh, from the owner and 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 certainly all top management right on into uh, superintendents and, and foremen um, to understand uh, and do private interviews where where people get comfortable telling me 
what's working and what's not working and and where where there's problems and and what their thoughts and ideas are because generally everybody has an, an interest in improving uh the company itself so those things those two things generally uncover uh a pretty typical list of opportunities for improvement it's really interesting yeah how how often does a business that you request say from financial reports for uh, are they able to provide those or that they have everything under control and they're able to get you those? Or um, have you have you found the companies that actually reach out to you for this coaching and consulting actually have that kind of under control for the most part? Under control is is, uh, is an, uh, maybe maybe an overstatement, but um, <laughs> uh, they all have some form of a financial statement one way or another. I guess everyone does or has to, especially in order to produce income tax returns and things like that. Um, so they have that, but do they have it at, well at hand and in, in an order that makes sense to manage the business by is, is another is another point. Um, and and frankly, um, a large majority of them are in, I'll call it good to fair shape as opposed to being in poor shape. Um, but I, I get I've got clients that span span the mix. And then when it comes to those financial reports, what are you, how, how can you help them kind of improve on that organization on those, uh, you know, taking control of their financials, uh, as kind of we discussed before, as well as, you know, you've got that experience as a CFO, uh, where, where do you start kind of picking apart those improvements in their business with those financial numbers? One of the first places is going to be to look at the, the businesses that are, the company is in and trying to subdivide it into service lines and break down uh, the revenue and the gross margins of each one of the service lines and start reporting so that we know what it is we're, 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 we're returning to the business from each one of the businesses, particularly compared to how we're, we're estimating it. It's very important for, for us to maintain an alignment between the estimating system and the financial systems that report it so that the costs are the costs and the margins are the margins. So that's that's one of the key things. Um, organizing the chart of accounts definitions is another one to make sure that we have an organized uh, flow from revenue through cost of goods sold and then through all the overhead categories. And uh, I, th I think uh, bottom up management is is also very key to being able to develop that and develop the people underneath that that understand uh, the financial statements through an open book uh, management style. Sticking with a uh, chart of accounts there and definitions, what what's the importance behind doing something like that? Ev behind having a chart of accounts and having definitions for each of these accounts for a. Uh, uh, landscape business. Well, for any business, it's it's going to be a matter of consistency that uh, all, all the costs are always getting charged to the same account. So when you're talking about that account, um, you can speak to it clearly as to as to what's in there and why it's misbehaving or or not. Um, and also consistency between the different business units, so that the same things are always going to the same same accounts, and we can compare. Uh, our our businesses are different businesses to each other, and why they're performing differently. Um, those those are the most important reasons. Uh, and that year over year, we're looking at again the same information, and we can we can see trends. If I've got three years lined up, I should be able to see my overhead categories all behaving in a similar way one year after the other. So all those definitions kind of create a like uh, solid workflow from from year to year, so that you can actually be able to see these consistent definitions and and where these costs are being allocated and how those fluctuate from year in and year out. Um, how if, if those are fluctuating for whatever reason, do you start to look at why they are fluctuating and try to get a reason behind that and, and to? Uh, alleviate what may be happening in the business, whether that's an inefficiency 
or uh, or maybe it's become more efficient and that's why there's become a lower fluctuation in some sort of overhead of costs. Like uh, taking a look at those numbers year in and year out, what does that kind of help you uh, discern in a certain business? So absolutely, you, uh, you can definitely determine, you know, if, if a, a number's fallen uh, out of the trend, if you will, of what, what history has been, that there's there's ways to put your finger on that. This most often happens on, on the direct cost side of things, you know, and it's most often gonna gonna uh, happen because we had a bad job, you know, that either uh, didn't uh, have a good estimate, a solid estimate, or encountered some some problems on it or some delays on it that just caused the job uh, to cost more. Now all of a sudden our our materials are greater, our labor is greater, and our margin is lower. So. Um, that's the most common, uh, uh, the common common problems and variations that we see in overhead. It's going to be it can be as as uh, as variant as as uh, us having high years of capital purchases and low years of capital purchases, or or having times when you you try not to buy, you know, fixed assets, and and then other times where you got no choice because everything's you know falling apart. Um, so that causes uh, some variation in when what your overhead costs are going to be and, and and just general spending i mean it's not like all overhead items are discretionary i mean most things are necessary but uh staffing becomes one of the biggest ones uh i think at in most of the businesses i would expect um your payroll in general to be around 40 percent of all your costs when you think about that um so that's that's uh, that's a pretty big expense especially when you throw on top of that payroll burden and health benefits and and cell phones and computers and and car allowances and things like that for for people that those things end up becoming um pretty pretty expensive you mentioned open book which is really interesting can you expand on what open book means and the benefits that you've seen with uh being an open book company so open book management is basically sharing the financial statements um and by that i mean the the profit and loss statement not so much the balance sheet um with uh with your your managers um and training them how to interpret them and what they mean and and teaching them that they can have influence on that financial statement and the outcome being, of course, the bottom line profit. Um, again, with, with other ass, uh, assets in your hands, such as the chart of accounts definition, side by side with the, the P&L statement, you can say, well, what's in this account and why did it go over? You know, And is, is it because we're undisciplined in, in our purchasing? Is it because we're not shopping out uh, and trying to get the best price on um, things that we're purchasing? Um, or is it because we're buying things that we didn't even budget and we probably didn't need in the first place? So um, those are all, you know, those and many other reasons are, are reasons that um, impact uh, how we can uh, change the financial outcome of a company. But open book management is about sharing it and growing people. And, and you'd be surprised at how much they embrace the opportunity to be taught this which is basically business 101 and and saying uh hey uh this is pretty cool um i like being part of these decisions and this level of management there are people that take to it and people that don't but i, I mean in some companies um, i'm engaged with we take that right on down to the foreman level and, and share information with them now, with that, have you seen uh, company or business owners use that to implement some sort of incentive program for employees? Say they, you know, complete a job within a certain margin and they were efficient on the job site. They completed it uh, under the budgeted time. Have you seen incentive programs rolled out uh, beyond being an open book company? Absolutely. Um, and I encourage that. Um and I mean, I think the whole the whole purpose of it is for that. And I mean, number one, the company has to be profitable first. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and we've got to be profitable even to a, a minimal level. Let's call it 5% profit before any incentive would, would kick in. And then 
at that level, you know, the incentive would would pay out, uh, you know, to the individuals probably based on their position, rank, uh, and influence on 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 the profitability, which which can be presented in a number of different formats. But um, I I do like to to uh, build incentive plans strictly around profit so that everybody's focused on it. Um, not that I don't want to be focused on on quality and customer service and safety and all those other things. But, um, you know, one one thing, the one one thing out of all of those that will kill a company is no profit. Um, and we don't want that. I just want to take a break from today's episode to talk about our sponsor, Cycle CPA. You may have a CRM or project management software in place, but what data are you using to ensure your estimating is accurate? Having a proper accounting setup and accurate bookkeeping done is key to understanding overhead expenses and other costs that must be recouped in your estimates. Cycle CPA is a remote bookkeeping and CFO firm that helps to connect the dots from the financial reports to the hardscape and landscape data needed in order to reach high profits. They provide landscape and hardscape industry benchmarking, job costing financials by service line, advisory meetings, and much more. Cycle CPA's team of accountants are specialized within the hardscape and landscape industry, and you can visit them at cyclecpa.com and for $200 off, mention the How to Hardscape podcast. Now back to our episode. Absolutely. Absolutely. With that, I, I like the idea of open book and just being transparent with your employees and, and uh, incentive plans or bonus structures for jobs completed. Um, that really interests me and is something that I've been looking at more and more often here. You did mention earlier breaking down services and understanding kind of where you are at with uh, those services in terms of, I'm sure, profit and uh, efficiency and and everything in a, in a business with that. And I'm sure everything that we've just talked about helps with identifying those services that may be less inefficient than others. Have you ever dealt with a business where you've axed a service, where you said, you know what, this doesn't make sense that you're offering it? Um, it's falling, it's lagging behind others that you're offering. And uh, it's better if we kind of move in this direction and ax this service. Or uh, adversely to that, have you ever implemented a new service based on, you know, equipment or uh, things in a business that were already there? So it made sense for you to take on that service. So so the answer is yes to both of those. I've, I've had situations where, um, I've, uh, uh, you know, axed, as you say, um, you know, a uh, certain, a whole business line and, and, in, and in a couple of different situations, in one case, um, because it was an outlying, uh, satellite branch and it was, uh, too small and it was too far and we didn't necessarily have the right leadership in, the, in, in, in place and, it just was not going to succeed. And it was basically strapping the business of, of other resources, you know, and of course, uh, most importantly, not making money. Um, and it didn't have a lot of upward potential. So um, we took away that distraction. Similarly, I've had uh, service lines that were, again, just not strong performers, not big growers. Um, and, uh, they were local and all that, but again, not not good performers and didn't really have a lot of potential. And again, you have a business unit that's still just taking away management uh, talent um, to try to make it work when if we got rid of it, we can apply that talent to the ones that are working and make them better. Um, so I've had organizations uh, to do both of that. And and absolutely, we've had I've got uh, we've added service lines and business lines uh, to different um, uh, different companies. Not to mention branches in themselves. I think one of the benefits of our our industry, and, you know, most I think even in, in hardscape, you know, you're you basically it's not so much a route based business as, for example, the maintenance is. But you know, you are you are providing your services to a local you know, territory or a region. Um, 
that does, does rely on on moving our our crews and our equipment and our materials to these jobs. So that all has to be factored in. We talked earlier about you know bottom up organization and empowering employees. I'm sure Open Book kind of plays into that, but I also see like with this newer generation um, coming into the labor force, it seems like that's what they want. They want to be empowered in the workplace. They want some sort of uh, responsibility and more of that, more of that um, sort of structure in place to help them embrace their role in, in the business. Do you find that business owners are more and more open to open book management um, or uh, just to give you a little bit of a launch pad into uh, discussing how do we create this bottom up structure in a business where we are uh, creating a culture where people actually have some sort of responsibility in what they do in the business. So I do find, uh, I mean, I actually, it's, it's a requirement for me to take on the client for them to be open book. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't run a business any other way and I wouldn't advise any business that, that would have it any other way. Um, so that's, that's kind of a, uh, a done deal for me. If, if you're not, if you're not willing to make that conversion, uh, you know, you, we need to get from here to there. Some owners don't want to do that because, um, they don't want people to see some of the financial uh, games, if you will, that they they may be playing, and and that's fine. Um, but uh, that's that's not how I I want to run my business, you know. Um, as far as uh, teaching people that, I mean, the entrepreneurial spirit gets born out of you know teaching people financial accountability and having organizational structure, open book management, and all those things. So. Um, once you start to to get that going in a in a young person, you know it kind of breeds itself and and starts to to grow. And you know now we have to teach people how to be problem solvers um, and to look at their financial statements and and to turn it around and how to be coaches to their employees instead of bosses. You know, two different things. Um, and ultimately. Uh, to develop their own budget. I mean, you're really going to do the bottom up, man, you're going to have the bottom up benefit at the point when, when your, your, your business unit manager is going to be developing his or her own budget. That's interesting that uh, coming on as a business with you, uh, open book is a necessity. Have you in your uh, career always kind of been that open book or at some point in your career, did you decide that this is the way that it, it needed to be? Uh, and speaking back before you were a coach or a consultant. It wasn't always that way, but um, a lar the, the largest portion of my career, for sure, uh, it has been uh, acknowledged as open book management is fundamental to really building the culture of the company, you know, with, with that kind of an attitude, you know, that that's truly a big part of what the culture is open book. And then how long before you start to see things paying off that uh, are changed in the business and what kind of indicators are you looking for in a business to say, you know what, this is, it doesn't have to be just like implementing open book strategies, but a culture change, which may be a little bit more difficult to actually, you know, look at quantitatively, or even things that are easier to look at quantitatively, what kind of indicators are you looking for over a, a period of time with a company to say, uh, this is working, what we've implemented here is working, it could be adding a service to a business, or like we said, axing a service in a business, or anything like that. But what indicators are you looking for in any of these scenarios to be able to, to, to help guide a company in the right direction? So the, the main indicator is the one that everybody's going to be automatically thinking about, and that's bottom line profit. Um, I expect any one of my clients uh, to expect uh, an improvement in their profit if they engage me to run their business. Um, I mean, I have that experience with 
all of my companies, um, you know, and so in some cases pretty dramatically. Sometimes it's because we've 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 massaged the the organizational structure. Um, in some cases, it's because uh, we've we've added discipline to the organization that wasn't there before. Uh, and in in some cases, it's just because we've grown it, um, you know. But I don't want to grow it until we can we can turn um, a healthy profit. And any one of our businesses should be turning um, eight to twelve percent net profit. Um, that's what we should be looking for as an operating profit. Um, and again, it, that's that should be driven by you know largely the uh, the gross margin. Which the gross margin in most of our businesses should be in excess of fifty percent, um, and of course that depends on how you set up your chart of accounts. Because if you move, if you, what you put in above and below, if you will, the gross margin line as far as costs and how you record that, um, well, will cause great variation on 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 what your gross margin would be. So, with with all that being said. Um... How does a business uh, engage with you yourself? Where where are they typically in their journey of a business ownership? Are they uh, businesses that are just starting out or are they businesses where they've hit some sort of uh, threshold in they just can't get their company over a certain uh, revenue amount or they just can't get their company over a certain number of crews. Where are they typically in their journey where they reach out to you, Ken, and ask for some additional guidance? Uh, that's a pretty broad range. Um, in revenue size, uh, you know, my clients will range from 3 million to 100 million in size. Um, in employee size, that's going to be anywhere from, um, you know, 40 employees to uh, 800 employees, uh, something along that lines. Um, and with that, uh, I do want to ask you, with all, all of your success through your career, uh, and whether that was growing the businesses in the past or helping coach and consult businesses nowadays, what has been one thing, if you could point to, has been a major driver in these businesses' success that you've seen a common thread throughout where uh, whether they have this in place, you can look at them and say, well, if I coached you along, I know you're going to have success. Was that the uh, owner's mindset? Was that the employees that they had in place? Was that the structure that they had in their business? Uh, whatever that might be, what, what's that common thread that you've seen with a business that you know that you can coach them through and get them to that profitability percentage that you're talking about? So organizing the company to have financial accountability is, is, is to me one of the most important things. Now that has so many different pieces to it. It's, it's how you organize the business it's 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 the open book management it's the tools that you put in place and it's, it's the financial statements it's the financial reporting it's it's key performance indicators but it's also growing and developing leaders you know um and and that's absolutely critical in my larger companies at some point at one point or another you get up to let's call it um four or five business units where you have four or five branch managers running their own business of anywhere from $4 million to $10 million a piece, you come to the point where you realize our, our core competency is, if we want to continue to grow this business, our core competency is growing branch managers. That's what we have to do. Because if we're going to grow, we're going to grow by this business unit that we set up, we've defined, we have, we have this model and, in, and the leader of that model is this branch manager. It works under this structure and it works under this financial statement. And we just need to put more out. So over the next 10 years, if we want to go from, you know, 30 million to 100 million, we're going to have, we're going to have to add, you know, seven new branch managers. Where are they coming from? 
Gotcha. Because they're, you don't want them to come from the outside. You want to grow them up through the culture of your company. And then, so why do you say that? Why why would you say that you'd want to grow them through the culture of the company rather than looking outside of the company and bringing in uh, these people? Well, I, I, there's absolutely benefits to both. Um, and, and I think you, you need to do some portion of bringing in outside people, but a small amount, particularly at that level. I mean, to hire somebody in at the highest level, at a branch manager level, um, and say, go run a branch, when he doesn't know who you are and who your company is and what your culture is, uh, can be dangerous um, and, 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 and very difficult to do. Um, so on the other hand, to hire somebody in outside the company and come in at a mid-level position where they can learn the culture under somebody else, uh, another branch manager, and then grow them to be a branch manager, that's absolutely um, beneficial. Obviously, everybody at some point comes from outside the company one way or another, but um, in order to grow branch managers uh, for a fast-paced growth company, we need to grow them from within, for sure. And not only that, but these people are here and they will be retained by you when they know that that growth opportunity is there. That's a, that's critical. That's that's part of the culture. That's part of them understanding. I, I want to be the next one of these. I want to go from here to here to here. If we can show them their career path and get them from where they are here today to vice president of business development or whatever, um, then um, you stand a much better chance of retaining them. And that's super important, especially in today's world with that. Uh, Ken, I do like to ask business owners that come on the show or previous business owners, specifically one question, and it is a big one. So I'll ask a question and then I'll ramble a little bit to give you a little bit of time to think about it. That question is, what is one thing you know now that you wish you knew from the beginning? And that can be personal related, business related, whatever it might be. But through your career, you've been in a couple of different businesses there. You've grown them, like you said, upwards of 100 million. And then today, as a coach and consultant, I'm sure you've learned a lot from many different companies with that. But Ken, what is one thing you know now that you wish you knew from the very beginning? I think it would be do more with less. Spend more time on on the big things and less on the little things. That kind of that kind of thing, um, and and that's more my my own personal tendencies because I I tend to get into the details and I I would uh, I I would have benefited earlier knowing um, I I should have I should have uh, been spending more time on on the bigger things and less on the little things, and that also comes that's hand in hand with uh, you know. You got to be more of a manager and less of a doer um, if, if you want to grow yourself. Um, so they go hand in hand. That's a great way to uh, end this interview. Uh, Ken, it's been uh, excellent to be able to pick your brain a little bit here. Where can our audience go to learn a little bit more about you, yourself, enterprise analysis, and to maybe even to start a discussion with you? So uh, our website is enterpriseanalysis.com. And um, they can check us out there. Um, you can call me direct on my cell, which is 240-793-3995. Uh, be glad to advise anyone that calls. Excellent, Ken. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Once again, check out CycleCPA, CycleCPA.com. If you need bookkeeping, accounting, or CFO services, mention How to Hardscape, get $200 off those services there. I'd really love it if you're on Apple Podcasts, leave us a rating in review. That really helps us with this show. Spotify, there is a five-star rating system there as well. If you want to go ahead and give us some stars there, that would be greatly appreciated. If you get something out of these episodes each Monday here, And we look forward to meeting with you next week on the How to Hardscape podcast.